Good afternoon. Good to see everybody today on this Ash Wednesday. We consider Ash Wednesday in the beginning of Lent. We think about how it is a penitential season. We take a good look at our sins and recognize how wonderful it is to have a Savior from them in Christ Jesus. And so we have an overall theme for these midweek Lenten services. It is the crucial hours. Today's theme is, I will keep the Passover. Introducing the overall theme, the crucial hours, I'd like to share a few words with you, making your worship all the more meaningful. Every hour counted and was crucial as our Savior Jesus went through suffering and punishment in our place. As he was thinking of those crucial hours ahead of him, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Those hours lived and died for us will be brought out during our midweek Lenten theme, the crucial hours. Those hours were not only crucial for our Savior, but crucial for us. Without those hours for us, we would be lost forever. As we walk together then through Jesus' passion, we will ponder key words and moments that demonstrate the thorough completeness of his saving work for us, the breadth and depth of his love for us, and the strength of his union with us. Again, today's theme is, I will keep the Passover. We warmly welcome all of our guests with us. This is the worship service that goes out online, live streaming. And so we also welcome our online worshipers. It's good to have all of you here. We're going to open with a hymn that is really a prayer. It's a prayer as we come closer and closer to the evening of this day. We're going to sing this opening song, hymn number 595, before the ending of the day. Please stand as we sing this hymn. Worship is found not only in the worship folder, but of course on the big screens. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness. If we claim to be without sin, Father, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrificed your only Son to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and in the joy of the Holy Spirit. 
let me serve you all my days. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we thank you for this day of grace now drawing to a close. Stay with us and warm our hearts with your forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. We sing the psalm for the day, Psalm 51a. If you're using a red hymnal, would be found in the front on page 86. Let's sing Psalm 51a. Lord, we confess our sins to you and plead for your mercy. We acknowledge that sin runs too deep in our nature for us ever to rid ourselves of it. But we thank you that Jesus has done what we could not do, washing us clean of every stain. We plead that your spirit would give us the strength to live a new life through Christ our Lord. We begin the Passion history with this first section and as we read, and we'll be reading together, because as you note from what's on the big screen and also in the worship folder, we have different groups speaking. 
the men at times, the women at times, the congregation at times, and I'll be speaking to begin. So we read responsively this portion of the Passion History of our Lord Jesus Christ. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted together how to arrest Jesus in some deceitful way and to kill him. But they said, Not during the festival, or else there might be a riot among the people. Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and spoke with the chief priests and officers of the temple guard about how he could betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He promised to do it and was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them away from the crowd. He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. told them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors, but it is not to be that way with you. Instead, let the greatness, greatest among you become like the youngest, and the one who leads like the one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table, or one who serves? Isn't it the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have remained with me in my trials. I am going to grant a kingdom to you, just as my Father granted to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me.
understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right because I am. Now, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen, amen, I tell you. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Worship continues as we sing the next hymn, the sermon hymn, hymn number 390. We'll be singing at this time, verses 1 through 5, Salvation unto us has come.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and our Passover Lamb, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The sermon text for this evening comes from Matthew chapter 26, verse 18, and it says, I will keep the Passover, words from our Lord and Savior there. Several decades ago, there was a Lutheran pastor who wrote a commentary on Holy Thursday, also known as Maundy Thursday, and Good Friday. And he named that commentary the Crucial Hours. You see, the word crucial actually comes from the Latin word for cross. And what a fitting name for that commentary as all the events there of that first Holy Thursday and Good Friday, well, were directed towards Jesus, headed towards the cross. But the word crucial today kind of has a little bit of a different meaning, doesn't it? It has the meaning of decisiveness or it's something being critical. Words that still very much fit the idea of Holy Thursday and Good Friday. And that's what we're going to be looking at through these midweek Lenten services of how those hours were crucial and critical for Jesus, his followers, and for you and me. This evening, we're considering those words of Jesus where he says, I will keep the Passover. And of course, that's what Jesus was doing on that first, well, Holy Thursday. He was keeping the Passover. What was the Passover? Maybe you can think back to your Bible history, back to when the Old Testament, when the Israelites were in Egypt and God was sending Moses to Pharaoh to have him let his people go. But Pharaoh, well, he was digging in his heels. He was hardening his heart, not listening to God, and wouldn't listen to what Moses had to say and kept refusing. So God was sending plagues on Egypt, plagues to try to get Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Well, finally, it came to the tenth and final plague, and it was the worst one of all, where God sent the angel of death to go and kill all the firstborn Egyptians in the land. But you see, the celebration of the Passover wasn't a celebration of the death and destruction that came on those Egyptians. It was a celebration of the love and the grace that God had for his people. Because you see, that first Passover, as that angel of death would come and see the house of the Israelites and saw that there was blood from that lamb, that Passover lamb, painted on the door frames, that angel would pass over that house and leave them completely unharmed, and the house and everyone in the house. That's what they were celebrating of the Passover, which eventually led to their freedom from Egypt. Of course, the Jews there at that time were celebrating the Passover, and of course, Jesus was celebrating the Passover. But probably not every Jew was celebrating the Passover the way they should. Maybe they looked at it in such a way that was maybe inconvenient for them this year. Maybe they said, well, I'll do it every other year, and I won't pay that close attention to all the little things that are in it. I'll go to the meal, but, uh, well, maybe we don't use unleavened bread this year. Leavened bread tastes much better. I'm sure there are some that were going through the motions. Yet there were probably a group of the Jews who, well, were holding very tightly to what the Passover said and how to celebrate it, going and doing all the things that they were supposed to do. In fact, I know for a fact there was a group, the Pharisees and those amongst them, those rulers of the Jews who were probably holding very tightly to it. However, their hearts were most likely in a different place. In a different place because instead of focusing on the Passover and doing there what God commanded to do, Their hearts were focused on, well, putting Jesus to death, planning things there, and maybe even making the Passover take a back seat because it was inconvenient because they had bigger and better things to take care of, like putting Jesus to death. In fact, though, if there was anyone who could say, well, you know, this year is not a good year for me to celebrate the Passover, or or I got to take time for myself, it, it probably would have been Jesus at that time, wouldn't it? Think about what he was dealing with. He had those rulers of the Jews that were plotting to kill him. He was, he was with his disciples there who, well, back in the Passion reading that we read today, we see what were they doing. They were bickering and arguing amongst themselves. And he even had one of those disciples, a friend of his, plotting to hand him over to be killed. For sure, if there was anyone who could say, I got to take some time for myself, or this is just not a good year to celebrate the Passover, it would have been Jesus. 
And what do we see him doing? We see him keeping the Passover. It's an interesting word there, saying keeping the Passover. Maybe, you know, we don't celebrate the Passover now as, as Jesus fulfilled it, but we use the word keep for other things, like keeping God's commandments, right? How we know we should be keeping the law of God in our lives, yet so often we don't. So often we might treat the keeping those laws that God has given us much like Oh, the command that God gave the Israelites to keep the Passover, where we make excuses or only do it when it's convenient. Maybe we'll say, I keep God's, I'll keep God's commands, but at a later time, right now, it's not convenient for me. Or I'll keep the third commandment, well, maybe next weekend. This weekend doesn't quite work. Or I'll keep God's commandments, uh, well, when it's not inconvenient for my life and what I want to do. I'll keep God's commandments, at least the ones that I feel are really important. You know, we sometimes think, well, these ones are important, but God will look the other way if I disobey this one here. Or maybe we end up bargaining with God and we say, well, I'll keep God's commandments more often than I break them. Maybe we even put a percentage on it. We might say, I'll keep God's commandments 85% of the time when when we look at ourselves we realize that that's a high and lofty goal that, goal that we don't even make. Or maybe we bring it down even lower, thinking, well, let's make it something that I can maybe achieve. Let's make it 20% of the time. Well, even then, we see that we fall short. Whatever we aim for, we see that we fall short because we see what the, what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3 as he's quoting Deuteronomy 27. He says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. The fact of the matter is, because we've said in our hearts, I'm not going to keep the command that is written in the book of the law, I'm not going to continually keep the commandments, shows that we deserve to be cursed. Sir, shows that we deserve, to deserve hell and eternal punishment. You see, the book of the law that it's referring to could refer to a couple of things. It could refer to the entire Old Testament or the first five books that Moses wrote. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Either way, we see that, well, there's laws in there that we need to keep. And either way, we see that there's a command there to keep the Passover to the Israelites. See, the Passover for the Israelites wasn't meant to be kept only nine out of the ten years. And the commandments that God has given us aren't meant to be kept only 90% of the time. They're meant to be kept all the time. Just like the Passover. So we see that Jesus was keeping the Passover. He kept the Passover every year. In fact, he even maybe, you can say, went a step further, and especially this one, he went so far as to, well, go and start planning those things out, directing the disciples where they need to go. He did this because we see how committed he was to fulfilling everything that was written in the book of the law. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18 says, "'Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets.'" I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor or the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus was all in. He was going to keep every single part of the law. And maybe for some of you who remember the King James Version, you know that that part says every jot or tittle there. Words that we don't use today. But a job would refer to the yod in the Hebrew or the iota in the Greek. A very small letter, something that maybe people who are writing would say, oh, I can not worry about this in their hand, daily handwriting. Maybe think of it today as maybe not dotting your I. Well, the tittle there in the King James would be something that's even smaller. A little line at the end of a letter. Maybe compare it to today as an S and a 5. They look very similar, right? Just a simple little bit of a different angle, and your 5s and Ss can look the same. You've seen my handwriting. You see that's where I oftentimes am lazy myself. And we might think, well, that's no big deal, right? Somebody reading can definitely tell because of the context. This is an S and this is a 5. It's not a big deal. So often we apply the same thing to the law. Where we say, it's not a big deal. I don't have to keep this. 
Thanks be to God that Jesus didn't have that attitude, that he was all in and was going to keep every single part of the law and keep the Passover all the way to the smallest little stroke of a pen. But Jesus kept the Passover so much that he, well, took control of it here and he sent Peter and John to go make preparations. He went and made sure the lamb was the proper lamb. He went and made sure that it was the unleavened bread, even though the leavened bread might taste better. He made sure to keep the Passover just as God had commandment, commanded it. And there on that Holy Thursday, that first one, we, well, remember it for many reasons, important reasons. One of them it was the establishment of the Lord's Supper, something we're going to be celebrating here tonight together. And we see that wonderful teaching of how Jesus was showing those disciples of how to be a servant. But sometimes we miss the fact that there's a lot of importance there on the fact that Jesus was keeping the Passover, keeping it perfectly, doing everything that God had asked in our place. Because you see, after Jesus was done celebrating the Passover that night, he would celebrate it in a very real way. Because the Passover wasn't just uh, looking back at a remembrance of God's grace and love, what he had for the Israelites when they were in Egypt. It was pointing forward. Pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate sacrificial lamb in Jesus as he gave himself up for us on the cross. You know, as we look back we, at the, what happened in Egypt, we saw that blood on the door and the angel of death passed over. We see how Jesus gave his blood for us so that now death no longer has a hold on you and me. All the way at the start of Jesus' ministry, we see this fact that he is the Passover lamb being brought out. The fact that John the Baptist said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There Jesus, after that first Holy Thursday, would go to the cross on Good Friday and pay for the sins of all the sinful people here on this earth. Pay for your sins and mine. To be our replacement. To go and, and be who you and I couldn't be. For all the times where we didn't keep the law perfectly. For all those times that we try to bargain with God and say, Oh, th I'm really good even though I haven't done this and this and this. Jesus was perfect in our place. Because of that, we see that there's no more need for sacrifice. Because he was the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. Because of that, we want to praise him and we want to worship him. You all here are being reminded of what Christ has done. And you're praising and worshiping him for the love that he showed you and me. And we want to keep doing that throughout the year. Not just make it a special focus during Lent, but every day of our lives. Focus on what Christ is and what he did for you and me. And let that play out in our lives. Because you see, you can show your love for him, not just by coming to church, but by going and living your lives of love for one another. In 1 John, it says, this is love for God that we keep his commands. We now look at those laws of God, those commandments, and we don't see it as this barrier, this big looming thing that we have to try to get perfectly for us to go to heaven, because we see that Jesus did it all perfectly in our place. We see it as a way to love and to serve him. And sometimes we might think we have to do these great and wonderful big things to show God's, uh, God that we love him. But sometimes it's those small things. Maybe it's something small that we can think, oh, this is forgettable. It's not a big deal. Maybe it's something like you go to the store and, well, say that you use cash. I know not a lot of people use cash anymore, but you go and buy something and, well, maybe you get an extra nickel accidentally back. The cashier gives you an extra nickel as you're checking out. And you go and take the time to go and return that nickel, that five cents. It may seem like something small. It may seem like something insignificant, like that jot that's there that we talked about. But to God, it's great and wonderful when it's done out of love for him. We want to show God the love that we have for him with our daily lives and everything that we do. So during this Lenten season, see how Jesus kept all of God's commands for you. And then rejoice by keeping God's commands and praising him. Amen.
At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please note that all the offerings that are brought forward today represent all offerings given online and dropped off at the office. We love because he first loved us. We'll sing the offering hymn, hymn 485, stanzas 1 through 5. Prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, it is with humble and contrite hearts that we enter this day, the holy season of Lent, to meditate upon the bitter sufferings and death that you, the innocent Lamb of God, endured for us. With deep sorrow we confess that also our sins which justly anger God and call for punishment, were the cause of your suffering and dying. God chose to spare us by laying upon you the iniquity of us all. O Savior, it is with mixed feelings that we consider your agony-filled death. For while we sorrow over our sins that caused it, we also rejoice over the salvation it brought us. Lord, thank you so much for going through what we should have gone through, and also by being perfectly obedient in our place so that we would be righteous before you. Since you died on the cross for all people and desire that everyone should know you have redeemed the whole world's transgressions, use us in your kingdom to make known to others your saving way of peace and hope, of mercy and love. Help us bear our crosses without complaining as you so unselfishly bore your cross for us. In all issues of life, teach us to come to you, precious Savior, and to rest our burden in the shadow of your cross. There we find help, and there we find the greatest comfort of all. Dear Lord, we come to your Holy Supper with repentant hearts, believing your words, that through this supper you give us the forgiveness of sins through your body and blood. Have us leave then at peace, that knowing that we are forgiven and lead us to show our love in everything that we do. In your name, dear Savior, we also pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. be seated for a brief announcement as we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members and those united with us in faith and doctrine come to Holy Communion approach up the middle aisle return by the side aisle when indicated kneel or remain standing at the rail receive the wafer with an open hand and take the wine cup yourself from the tray if you prefer to be handed the wine cup simply hold out your hand hold your wafer hand up like stop if you would like the gluten-free wafer available in a sleeve on the tray, and non-alcoholic white wine is also available in the middle of the cup tray, and cup receptacles are along the walls. And the common wine cup or chalice is provided as a choice, and the general blessing will be given to all at the close of Holy Communion. At the beginning of Communion here, the junior choir will sing an appropriate communion song, Remember Me, followed by the congregational hymn, Hymn number 304, Jesus Sinners Does Receive. Please come, all things are now ready.
Please stand. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith and to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. We sing together. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. close our worship as we sing verse 6 of hymn number 390. We remain standing for this verse. So good to start this season with all of you here, and we'll continue together to worship not only on the weekends, but also on the weekday, Wednesday, uh, the services 3.30 and 7 o'clock. We certainly are thankful to the junior choir and staff directing the junior choir for adding to our worship today. Remember the services again, 3.30 and 7, with the meal in between from 4.15 to 6.30. And so in a moment, we'll close, uh, dismiss you, and before we do that, we'll have the table prayers as we think about the meal either here or at home we're going to enjoy. The Ladies' Aid is hosting the meal today with the delicious traditional chili, uh, and it, it smells great. So uh, Go on down and enjoy the meal, and at the same time, you can support uh, their work that they do to God's glory. The only time we don't have a group yet uh, handling or hosting a meal is on March 16th. We're looking for that to be filled as well. Next week, we'll be looking at the theme, Satan has asked to sift all of you. Uh, that's what we'll be looking at uh, next, uh, next week, and the meal will be hosted by the Altar Guild. God's blessings to you all. Let's go to our Lord with uh, common table prayers, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. God be with you all. Thank you.